project, which is a project that um, that we ran between 2010 and 2014. It was um, uh, funded by the EPSRC with the tagline Sustainable Software for Audio and Music Research. And um, it was a sort of um, smaller, shorter sibling project to the Software Sustainability Institute that was uh, funded in the same call as uh, caused the creation of the Software Sustainability Institute. But, um, but with a subject specific focus and based in a single centre, the Centre for Digital Music, with the remitter serving the whole UK audio and music uh, research community. The, um, obviously it's, it's started in 2010, it was uh, a decade uh, more and more ago now, and um, a lot has changed since then and the decisions that we, that we took about, um, about what to, uh, what, what work to do um, were based on things that, um, that were very much of their time and that will be relevant to some of the things that I'm about to say. Now, um, and it's interesting looking back on it because uh, it also finished a while ago and while I still work in the field it's, um, it's, uh, it's been a while since I've had to collect together these thoughts. The, we took the view that the Software Sustainability Institute was going to um, take a fairly high level direction setting evangelical kind of um, outreach um, uh, angle and so what we would do would be more about practical targeted interventions. If we found that there were things that we believed that we could do ourselves to improve um, improve the situation in terms of software development in in audio and music research then we would we would actually try and do them we would we would try and do things ourselves rather than or not 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 rather than but in addition to talking about the subject and um and it's also worth noting that the, the sorts of researchers that we were dealing with i found um amelia's talk this morning about uh, early career researchers i really identified with that because um a lot of the people that we're dealing with come from arts or music kind of backgrounds and don't necessarily have much experience with software and even people who are fairly um hard technical sort of backgrounds like maybe hardware um uh, people don't necessarily haven't necessarily done much by way of collaborative software development in the past so we started by um by carrying out a, a survey and going and visiting some people around research groups in the uk and what we wanted to establish essentially was how far are people actually publishing the code that they use to produce the papers that they write. So when you publish a paper, you may have some figures in it, for example, that you needed to run a, a, a script or a program or something in that lab or whatever to produce. Do, do you publish those, um, those scripts or those programs at the same time as your paper? Is there actually enough information out there accompanying your publication for other people to reproduce it or at least to replicate it and if not why not what are the barriers and we had a number of very informative responses and from these we um, made a note of four things that we identified as barriers to code publication and reuse and the, here they are so the, the the first one was a lack of education and confidence with code now this was a very obviously a very common response that we got for why don't you publish your code is because i don't believe it's good enough I, I'm, I'm afraid to have other people looking at it and i think i think this is still common at the time it certainly was the second one was lack of facilities and tools now here the landscape has changed rather um but in 2010 although i believe we did have github and bitbucket and sourceforge certainly have been around a while and there were these sorts of services you could use for uh, open and collaborative publication and um, version control, they're all fairly daunting and there's this general feeling that was quite common that um, if you wanted to, to, to publish your code with one of these, you were really signing on to a sort of hardcore open source, everything I do is public. There's, there's, it, it was a quite different attitude to the sort of different feeling from the sort of collegial collaboration that people were used to. Uh, lack of incentive for publication is simpler, that's more like, you know, will my citation counts go up? Is it on what the, the REF as it is now? Um, and then a whole category, a whole class of technical problems like um, you publish your code and then in the next version of BATLAB it breaks and so you might as well not have published it at all because it doesn't work anymore anyway. So 
for each of these four, we, we tried quite a few different things. And for each of these four, we identified a specific thing that we were going to try and do, and we attempted to do it. But I'm going to focus on just the first two here, uh, a couple of illustrative examples, because I think these are interesting because they, um, they illustrate how a lot depends on uh, where the tides of history take you after the, uh, after the decisions you initially make. So when it comes to lack of education and confidence with code, we already had a plan with this. We, we described in our, our, um, our first uh, grant submission that we were going to work with uh, Greg Wilson, the founder of the Software Carpentry Project, and that's what we did. So during 2010, we uh, sponsored him to develop a, a set of software carpentry materials. And then at the end of 2010, he came over and we funded him to come over and, and um, we worked with him to put on a week-long software carpentry course, which we called the uh, Sound Software and Software Carpentry um, Autumn School. It was supposed to be a summer school, but it overran. And, um, and this was in London in November 2010. And it was, it was successful, but it was extremely um, uh, uh, demanding because it was a whole five day week of full days of um, training in, in software skills, running a, a full gamut of different topics. Um, and after that, it, I think the, the lesson was clearly that this was too demanding for, while pe the people who had attended it, who were about 30 early career researchers had generally enjoyed it, it was, it was too much to try and do regularly. And, um, and Greg went back and we continued to work with him again after that and with the Software Sustainability Institute, we put on a number of more software carpentry um, workshops from 2012 onwards and that evolved into the sort of two or three day um, routine that has become more common and that has really uh, taken off since then. So that's an example where the decisions that we took happened to be perhaps by luck rather than judgment, I don't really know, but they happen to be on the on the side of history and that worked very well. Um, this, the second one is quite intriguing because um, for the problem of lack of facilities and tools, we we saw that people were afraid to engage with services like GitHub. Uh, they were difficult, Git is always still difficult to use in many ways and, um, and it certainly wasn't apparent that this was going to be the a sort of universally assumed way that you would do your uh, publication in, of, of, of code amongst developers generally, certainly not amongst researchers. And so we took the view that we could stand up a sort of code hosting site um, specifically for audio and music researchers. So it would feel like a place that you would go to with your colleagues and could share work with them before making it public. And, um, and to this end, we, we modified and adapted the Redmine um, code hosting site and deployed that on, on it's, it's still there, we still maintain it and run it and you can still register and use it on code.sandsoftware.ac.uk. And it's been, it's been good, it's a, it was a nice initiative, it's been useful, but it's pretty clear now that, that history was going in another direction there and that probably we should, we would have been better off setting it up than saying that people, what we should do is get people more comfortable with using the tools that, had we known it, it, then became sort of world dominating things like GitHub. So there's an, a, an interesting example on the other side where we did something that felt like the right thing to do, but, um, but it's, it's not clear now that it was, it was going in the right direction. I would say, and this is my last slide, that um, if I, I mean, there are a lot of other things that we did, including many software development collaborations and interventions that I could happily natter on about for a while, but I'm not going to because I don't have the time. Um, but if I was asked now, what things did we do that in my subjective view were the most successful, I would say that generally the sweet spot is neither for us with neither writing software ourselves, nor talking in generalities about the ideal way to write and publish software, but things, activities that involve talking to people about real specific examples of code that they had to deal with or that they knew that they were going to have to deal with soon. So all of these things fall into that sort of category, like software carpentry, for example, you're, you're presenting people with problems in real research code and helping them solve them. We ran a series of annual seminars with a, bit, a little bit like this event here that I'm talking about now, actually, with the 
presentations from practitioners in the field who'd worked with bigger software projects and had some idea how, how they went. And they were very helpful, I think. We did a series of visits to research groups, including one to solve a purpose, but Jonathan, and, um, and um, spoke to people one on one. And we definitely should have done more of this. This is something that tailed off a little as we got involved in other things later on in our project. But in fact, in hindsight, it was an extremely good use of time and, and effort that we that would have paid off even more had we done more of it, I think. And finally, we ran a series of reproducible research prizes, which were associated with um, things like conferences where papers were being published, where we gave a sort of nominal prize for some submission that, that, that we found matched. We evaluated this with the help of the Software Sustainability Institute, that we found matched a set of reproducibility criteria. And that was a good way of producing a dialogue around software and publication. And um, that's all I have to say about this just now. So thank you.